inductive and capacitive reactants. Okay, so in a purely resistive circuit, as we see here, then resistance would be the opposition to the current flow. When thinking about an AC circuit that does not have resistance, but instead is only inductance or capacitance or both, then reactance would be the opposition to current flow in that circumstance. And next, an AC circuit with both reactance and resistance would have impedance as the opposition to current flow. In all the cases, impedance, reactance, and resistance are all expressed in ohms. And we see the different symbols. So we see a Z for impedance, we saw X for reactance, and we know R for resistance. And this is going to be explained through the video, so we're going to understand this, but really keep in mind that when we're thinking about impedance being the opposition to current flow, and we're thinking about, okay, that has to do with reactance and resistance, you need to use your reactance and your resistance to find your impedance, and that is going to be your opposition to current flow. That will still be expressed in ohms, but in any circuit, you're going to have some wire, and that wire will have some resistance. It will also have some reactance, and together it will have some impedance. And the same thing for any coil. Any coil is also going to have impedance, reactance, and then as we also know, inductance and capacitance. So then we're going to start getting into inductive and capacitive reactants because as we just went over reactance has to do with inductance and capacitance and then of course we're thinking about resistance okay so we're just thinking how all these things are isolated in their own ways but in an actual real life circuit you're going to have all of these things but of course to figure out each of the values you're going to use the knowledge of how they're isolated to find each one of the values so just know each one of those isolated resistance, reactance, and impedance are each going to act in their own as an opposition to current flow. So as I went over in my last video, if you had a purely resistive circuit in theory, then the circuit would be instantaneous. But when you add inductance, it's going to cause an opposition to the change in current. So unlike resistance, reactance, or impedance being an opposition to current flow, the inductance is an opposition to a change in current flow. And because of this, inductance only opposes current flow when the current is changing. Since current flow is constantly changing in AC circuits, the inductance is constantly opposing those changes in the current. So we know AC as alternating current. How inductance opposes this change in current is quite interesting. It actually does this by producing its own self-induced voltage, which acts as a counter electromagnetic frequency that opposes the current flow. This opposition to current flow that is a product of inductance can be measured and would be known as the inductive reactance. The electrical SI unit for inductance is Henry, but oftentimes an inductor has the symbol L that just symbolizes the inductor as you see here. Because of this, it makes sense that inductive reactance uses the symbol XL, where X stands for reactance and L stands for inductance. So you have to read it backwards, but you see inductive reactance. What designates the quantity of inductive reactance is the amount of inductance and the frequency that we are working with. Since a frequency is recorded in a given second with hertz, then we know that a frequency tells us how many cycles happen in one second. Therefore, we can make sense of how a low frequency will experience peaks and troughs at a much slower rate. So we see I had to draw actually a much wider graph here horizontally because the higher frequency takes up so much less space that this had to be much bigger. And I actually finished this wave. So you just visually can see a low frequency is going to take more time. A high frequency, of course, it's more frequent, has more rates of change in a given second. So we can tie this into how inductance is going to change the current flow only when the current is changing. And because of this, we see how when we're measuring this change, the inductive reactance, the frequency is obviously going to change the rate at what the actual current is changing at. The formula for inductive reactance is two pi frequency inductance. So of course those are all multiplied. And when we talk about pi, we're just thinking 3.14, so it's simply 2 times 3.14 times your frequency times your inductance. Okay, so if we had a circuit rated at 60 hertz, 
we have 50 volts on the circuit and we have 10 milliamps. What is going to be the inductive reactance? Okay, so of course I'm solving for XL. Don't have unlimited room here. So we're going to have 2 times 3.14 as previously discussed. And you can multiply this all together. Or you can think in chunks. I'm going to write it just like this. 2 times 3.14 in one chunk. And just know you could just multiply all together in a calculator. Whatever you want to do. And then we're going to do our frequency times inductance. So we have 60 hertz. And we have times 10 milliamps. So hold up. You're not going to write 10. And you're not going to write 10 milliamps. You got to convert this. Because what you're doing is you're doing frequency times inductance. Not frequency times milliadductance, microinductance. Okay, so you got to realize it's in its whole value. It's just Henry's. So we got to convert the 10 millihenries to Henry's. So if you watch my last video on inductors and capacitors, it's going to do you a lot of good because I talked about everything you're going to need to know in this video from the symbols, mathematical symbols, symbols in the schematics, and even things like how to convert 10 millihenries into regular Henry's, these metric prefixes and the formulas that you need to do to solve them and convert them into the actual values that they are when you're doing formulas like this. Okay, so long story short, we need to turn 10 millihenries into a value of actual Henry's. Okay, so when you have milli of something, like we have the milli Henry, what that's going to mean is a thousand. So I guess I'll just write that out. Okay, and because milli is one thousandth of something, if you want to convert it and you want to get it out of the milli value, what you got to do is you got to take the value that you have, so call it n, and you got to times that by 10 to the negative third power. So you got to understand when you have milli of something, okay, you're doing with decimal and you have one thousandth of something. So of course, written as a decimal, you'd have your tenth, hundredth, and then you'd have your thousandth. So 0.001. Okay, so get a calculator out, do one times 10, and then to the negative third power. And if your calculator's like mine, it's a little ridiculous, then it's gonna say an actual fraction. But at least on my calculator, I have this two arrows, which has an F and D, which means fraction to decimal conversion. So I just press those two arrows, and I get the conversion. So we see 0 0.001, also 1,000. Can okay, be sure I do a lot of research and double check the things that are in my videos so there aren't mistakes. The one thing that drives me nuts is when someone's trying to teach you something and they have a bunch of mistakes the whole time that you have to figure out and then you don't know if what they taught you from the beginning was correct because that's how you caught the mistakes or if the mistakes are actually correct but they taught you the wrong way. So it adds all this confusion I don't like that. Of course, if you see any accidents, uh, make sure to leave that in the comments, but I double check things. There should be no mistakes. And funny enough, I actually have very little followers on my YouTube. I have a music channel and I have this channel, post music theory videos and electrical theory videos. I don't have very many followers, but I put so much time into making quality videos and I don't expect anything from anyone, but I find it funny that I do that. And then I try to learn stuff from other people who have a much bigger following or they're much more professional okay and I end up finding so many mistakes in what they're teaching me that I have to figure out you know what's actually happening through all the mistakes but then also don't think okay I had to go through that and now I'm gonna teach you the faster way so you're not gonna have to go through all this stuff and we're gonna know it the same uh, I think I know it a lot better now because I had to go through a bunch of confusion and actually teach myself the thing and actually really comprehend it and think about it. So you're learning the whole way, no matter what. And if you actually have a motivation to really make sure that you understand things the correct way, you're going to straighten out those little things that are incorrect and you're just going to know the topic better. So it's only good for me, but it's not a video about me. So we see milli is a 1000, very simple. Okay. And we got to think about it like that when we see milli. We got to think it's 1,000. So we got to comprehend that. And with that, we don't got to think very much. We know it's 10 to the negative third because we know that's going to make it a 1,000. As we just saw when we took a single one and did that, we turned it into a 1,000. And again, my inductor and capacitor video goes over even the milli and the micro and even the pico and even the mega goes over the conversions. So make sure you watch that video. Okay, what that means is if we want to convert 10 millihenries into henries, a regular value, 
then we're simply just going to get 10 times 10 to the negative third power. Again, if I do 10 times 10 to the negative third on my calculator here, I see 1 hundredth. In other words, 0.01. Okay, so now we have the second chunk. So of course that would normally go quicker, but I wanna make these videos so if you don't know certain things that are vital to understanding the lesson, that I'll at least have a little mini lesson and I'll teach you what you need to know. And also mention videos where you'll get a further, more in-depth version of those explanations. Okay, so we see everything here. And as I said, we could just multiply everything together. But as you see how I wrote it, we could also do it in two separate chunks. It's all multiplication. So let's actually just multiply everything together and see what we get. So of course, I'm going to do 2 times 3.14 times 60 and times 0.01. And what all that is going to equal is 3.768. Okay, and resistance, reactance, and impedance are all with what electrical unit? The ohm. So 3.768 ohms. Now that we know inductive reactance, we can now use Ohm's law to figure out our reactive current. We're used to this formula being voltage equals current times resistance. What we're instead going to be thinking is a variation based off this, where we have voltage equals current times impedance. Because of this, if we want to solve for and find current, current equals voltage divided by impedance. You will see a video soon that I will release on how to change the subject of a formula. So how to change this formula from being about voltage and taking everything here and converting all those things into now a formula that is about finding current just by rearranging everything. Okay, so it's a very useful subject. And when you only have three things that you're working with, it's very simple. But once you start getting into more numbers, things get a little more complicated. Okay, but as we see, there's our formula. Here's our amount of inductive reactants. And if you don't remember from this example, we had 50 volts we were working with. So simply 50 divided by 3.768. And we'll see the product of that is 13.27 amps. Okay, now we're going to be looking at the current and voltage phase relationship. So here we see voltage is represented in red, current is represented in black, and we do see that they are rising and falling at the same times. This would be known as being in phase with each other. This would be in terms of theoretically a purely resistive circuit where we see voltage and current rising and falling at the same times, but because in a realistic scenario you always have some inductance, then we're going to see how inductance changes this. Because if you have an inductive circuit, your voltage and your current are not going to be in phase with each other. And since inductance opposes the change in current, thus adding a time constant and slowing down the rate of change for the current, adding a rate of change for the current, now we're going to have it where inductance is going to lag behind the voltage because of that. And to clear something up, if you don't understand the word phase, phase of a wave quantifies the position in time of a wave. So when voltage and current are falling at the same time, that's why they're in phase with each other. This is where they are occurring in time. You do see a difference in the height. So the magnitude is different. We also see them starting and ending at the same time. So we know they have the same frequency. They also are in phase with each other and they just have a different magnitude. So it's good to know the three factors of a wave. And just as I said, that has to do with magnitude, frequency, and phase. Okay, so now what happens if we have a purely inductive circuit? Well, current and voltage will be out of phase, but by what degree the current will lag behind the voltage by 90 degrees. And you see due to not being inconvenient and going 90 degrees back, representing the 90 degree lag, it's actually shown 90 degrees before the voltage. But just know that since you're thinking about inductance here, you know that inductance is going to slow down the current. And we're thinking about a purely inductive circuit here, so no resistance right now. And with that, you see the 90 degree difference, okay? So just think inductance, current is going to be behind. We see it graphed out, we see 90 degrees. So we know it's a 90 degree lag behind the voltage. Since impedance is going to be a measurement when you have resistance and reactance, since we're only dealing with inductive reactance here, we have an inductor, 
then the impedance value that we would measure would be the same thing as the reactance value. Okay, so in this case, in this simple circuit here with only having a purely inductive circuit, impedance and reactance are going to be the same number. But as I've been mentioning, every single circuit, every scenario, every coil, anything has some amount of resistance to it. So because of this, you're never gonna have a purely resistive circuit with no inductance where you have everything completely in phase. And in this case, you're never gonna have a completely inductive circuit where everything is completely 90 degrees out of phase to its maximum potential. You're always gonna have some resistance. You're always gonna have some inductance. You're always gonna have some of both. And we could see how when we had the resistive circuit, we were in phase. The inductive circuit were out of phase and we can make sense that when we start to change the quantities around how we're going to land in here so the current is always going to lag somewhere in between this perfectly in phase and the 90 degrees out of phase where it is positioned exactly is determined by the ratio of resistance over inductive reactance and in this case don't think of the ratio and the decimal it's going to be creating and solve for it but just think simply a ratio. Okay, so for example, if we we're thinking resistance and inductance and we we're thinking we had eight ohms of resistance, we could see how that would affect us closer to being in phase. And if we instead flip the values, then we can see, okay, we have more inductance now, we're gonna be going more out of phase. So just simply think of the ratios as which is your bigger number. And that was my bad, I should have actually represented this as resistance and inductive reactance since that number that we're working with that is opposing the current flow is not just having to do with the inductor, but it's the inductive reactance. Okay, so XL. So in that case, if our resistance and our inductive reactance were the same number, in other words, they're equal in ratio, then the current is gonna be out of phase with the voltage by 45 degrees. Okay, so calculating impedance in an inductive circuit. Impedance must be calculated for circuits that contain inductance, capacitance, and reactance. Here's the formula for finding impedance in an inductive circuit. So don't let anything scare you or anything with the square root, it's really simple. So you just have resistance squared plus inductive reactance squared added together and then you square root it. Okay, so we see the inductive reactance and the resistance are both 10 ohms, you're gonna think 10 squared plus 10 squared. We know 10 squared is just 10 times 10, so we have 100 plus 100. Because of that, we simply just get the square root of 200, and we will see that is 14.142. And of course, since it's impedance, it's also gonna be ohms. So now that we found the total impedance, so the values from the resistance and the inductive reactance, those are plugged into the formula to give us the impedance. So now that we do have the impedance, we can again use Ohm's law, and now we can find the actual total current of the circuit. A different way to express the idea where impedance is a relationship of inductive reactance or reactance and resistance is through a graph. A vector is a specific graph that works with a number that has a certain direction as well as magnitude. A vector can be expressed on something simple like a GPS navigation on your phone from a location to another location. You might look at your GPS and it says there's a restaurant five miles east. In this circumstance, the five miles is the magnitude and the direction is east. Vectors can be used to express many things such as the relationship between electrical quantities. Impedance is the total opposition of current. Impedance can be calculated when an AC circuit contains resistance, inductance, and capacitance. So if some dots are connecting here, we see that we're just finding the impedance right now when we have inductance and resistance. Okay, so we're not thinking about capacitance yet. Things do get more complicated when we start to have everything in one circuit. So we're kind of isolating some stuff here, understanding how it works isolated, and then it's going to make a lot more sense once everything's put in together. So as we see, this graph represents the relationship between inductive reactance and resistance. In between the two vectors, we have an angle. This angle is represented by this symbol, which you might recognize as theta in trigonometry. This angle is what determines how much current is going to lag the voltage. Okay, so now we see a capacitor in this simple circuit, and we're talking about capacitive reactance. 
So we see the X for reactants, the C for capacitor. Interestingly enough, Capacitance also results in an opposition to current flow. The size of the capacitor is inversely proportionate to the capacitive reactance. This means if the capacitor is larger, then the capacitive reactance is smaller. Just like with our inductive reactance, with our capacitive reactance, frequency is also going to be a factor that affects the current flow in an AC circuit with capacitance. So we oftentimes think of capacitance as opposing a change in voltage. But we also know of capacitors as storing electrical energy. Formula for capacitive reactants is very similar as the formula for inductive reactants. And the main difference is that it starts off as one over, and then you have basically everything the same, except capacitance and inductance are gonna be switched out. So we again see a two pi frequency, and instead of L, now we have a C. The main difference, like I said, is that it is one over this, while when we had inductance, we didn't have one over the two pi frequency inductance formula. Okay, so we already went over that pi is 3.14, we also went over it's all multiplying here, so we could get all this and we could multiply it all together, and like I said, we could also separate it in two separate chunks to where we separate each chunk, multiply the first chunk into one, second chunk into another, then we just multiply everything together, and then of course we do one over everything. Okay, so next we're working with a circuit with 50 volts, 60 hertz, and 10 microfarads, and find and solve for the capacitive reactants. Of course, try to solve for it before I give you the answer. Okay, so I always start off by just redoing the formula. So 2 pi frequency C, and then I'll plug everything in. Okay, so 1 over 2 times 3.14 times the frequency, so 60 hertz. And then this is the, again, where we go into the capacitance. And we started off with 10 microfarads. Okay, so we remember that milli equals a thousand. Another way of expressing that's 10 to the negative third. And we need to understand that micro, that micro is 10 to the negative sixth because this is milli. So when you think micro, think one millionth. And the best way to think about this is since milli is one thousandth, okay, and just see what I'm doing. One thousandth is normally going to be a decimal. It could also be a fraction, okay? That's a thousandth, either one of those, of course. But when you look at one thousand, since you're getting a thousandth, how many zeros does that have? Okay, you have three zeros, and here you have negative three. So you want to go negative three because you're doing a one thousandth. Of course, if you did times a thousand, you do ten to the third power. So you're just doing... 10 to the negative third power. You're saying you want a 1,000th when you're working with a decimal, but you can always just look at the zero. So the same thing when we are looking at one millionth. Okay, so we know the millionth has those two sets of those three zeros. That's how you can easily look at it and say, okay, that's a million. And because of that, we have six zeros. So now it's pretty easy to remember. Okay, so we're starting off with 10 microfarads. So we're simply just going to do the number we're starting off with, the 10 microfarads times that number I just talked about, 10 to the negative sixth, because micro is a million. What that equals is going to be our number here, our capacitance, because we're not working with micro capacitance, we're working with capacitance. Okay, and we have one, two, three, four zeros and a one. First, because we started off with 10 and we're doing times the 10 to the negative 6, that we'd get a millionth if we're starting with 1. Since we're starting with 10, we're going to get almost the same thing, but one decimal place over. So instead of a 1 millionth, we have a 100,000th. We see with our 10th, 100,000th, 10,000th, 100,000th decimal place, okay? So now we're just going to multiply all this and then get that and then divide 1 over that total product. And we'll see, we come up with the product of 0.0037, 
six, eight. And of course, remember, we're going to do one over that. And we'll see, we get the answer 265.39. Can you remember we're working with reactants? So we're working with ohms as our electrical unit. So we found our capacitive reactants. 265.39 ohms. Just like before, now that we solved for capacitive reactants, we can now use Ohm's law and we could be thinking about instead of resistance as impedance, or in this case, we are working with reactants, but like we went over, just like with inductance, if we have this purely capacitive circuit here, then our reactance is going to be our impedance. And again, we're isolating things, so things get more complex when we start mixing everything together in more realistic scenarios. Okay, so we have our reactants and we have our volts. We want to find current, so we can see that that is going to be voltage over impedance. So simply 50 over 265.39. Okay, we'll see from this, we get the answer 0.188. And again, this is going to be known as our reactive current. So it's going to be in amps. Okay, again, we're going to go over the current and voltage phase relationship. But this time we're looking at a capacitive circuit. And we're thinking about a purely capacitive circuit. The phase relationship between current and voltage is exactly the opposite as when we think about a purely inductive circuit. So we see a similar thing where we see voltage, red, current as black. Instead of current lagging behind voltage by 90 degrees, we have now current leading the voltage by again, 90 degrees. So we have that same 90 degree number, that same kind of relationship, but it's the opposite, it's flipped. So again, we're thinking about now capacitance and we can see this is drawn the same way as it was with inductance, but think inductance, the current is going to lag and with capacitance, the current is going to lead. Okay, and this one actually makes more sense because this is leading, so you can see that. And I was already explaining my hypothesis or the inductance because I think it just makes it a little easier to read it. It makes more sense. It's visually easier to look at, but I think some of the numbers might be a little more comprehensible if you're just thinking about a 90% lag instead of always thinking about it being 270% out of the 360, because you can see that already gets a little more complicated. But of course, as we know, all circuits, even a purely capacitive circuit is going to have some amount of resistance. Even if that is a very small amount of resistance, which is something that you'd actually want, you're always going to have an amount of resistance. When we see the current taking lead, what determines the phase position, the exact position, is the ratio of resistance and capacitance. So again, we're just looking at which one is going to be bigger. Do we have more resistance? Do we have more capacitance? We've been thinking about the extremes, okay? This is if we have no resistance at all in this situation with the 90 degrees and we only have capacitance and this is just giving us more of an understanding of how the ratio is going to affect the phase relationship so again if we're thinking of the ratio and we have more resistance then of course the current is going to be more in phase with the voltage because a purely resistive circuit as we looked in the beginning or further more in the beginning we saw that they were in phase with each other Okay. And again, if we have more capacitive reactants, then we're going to have the current being more out of phase with the voltage. Okay, so we see it's simple. It's basically the same thing as we saw with inductance, but it's flipped. So where instead of having the current lagging behind the voltage, like with inductance, we just have the current leading in front of the voltage when we're thinking about that phase relationship. Other than that, it's represented the same way, the 90 degree difference. It's just the fact, is it going to be lagging or is it going to be leading and similar to before if we have the resistance and the capacitive reactance at equal numbers on the ratio we're going to see that the current leads the voltage by 45 degrees okay so we see it's good to group inductance and capacitance together because the formulas and solving for them is so similar whether it's doing the exact thing or thinking about the exact opposite thing, because that's generally what we're doing here, just to kind of simplify it. Then it kind of helps reinforce each one because you're almost doing the same thing twice, but slightly different depending on each one. And for some of it, 
it's just like you're switching out certain things okay so this is going to be exactly that so now we're going to think about if we're in a capacitive circuit and if we want to find impedance we have the formula or just like before we have a square root and just like before we have resistance squared plus reactance and the only difference is that this time instead of inductive reactance we have capacitive reactance so we had the same exact formula before except we had capacitive inductance and that was our formula for impedance with capacitive inductance okay so we see it's literally the same thing but now we're working with capacitance same formula okay so we're just going to think about a simple circuit where we're going to have 10 ohms and we're just going to use that number for both of them so we're going to think about 10 ohms for resistance and capacitance the same thing we're just going to do 10 squared plus 10 squared and of course from there we get 100 plus 100 which then we can just think about as the square root of 200 which equals our 14.14 and of course impedance reactance resistance use the electrical unit of the ohm so there's our impedance. So you see we use the same numbers as before too. And again, you can use a vector to represent the relationship of resistance and reactance. With again, the direction and magnitude. In this case, we're working with an angle. Okay, questions. Number one, the opposition to current flow in a circuit with inductance or capacitance or both. Okay, so we're not working with resistance at all. We have either inductance, capacitance, or we can have both. Okay, and if you don't know the answer, just think about how we solve. Okay, and of course that would be our reactance. And this is because when we're thinking about reactance, we're not including our resistance in there to come up with the answer. Again, we're simply thinking two pi, our frequency, and then either capacitance or inductance. Okay, question number two. We actually have a question mark this time. Total opposition to current flow. Okay, so that's really important. That definition. Total opposition to current flow in a circuit that contains resistance and reactance. Okay, so when we are looking with resistance and reactance, of course, we're going to be dealing with impedance symbolized with a Z, and it's good to really know that definition. So impedance, the definition for that is actually the total opposition to current flow in a circuit. As I keep reminding you, an actual circuit in real life is going to have basically all these things. You're going to have some inductance, some reactance, some resistance. This is all going to affect the current flow and also the phase relationships, everything as we've seen. But we also see that we can isolate the things in some different ways. And then also if we're working with our total opposition to current flow, we just really need to think our reactance and our resistance and the formula that we use where we have the R squared plus the reactance squared and then everything is square rooted. Okay, next question. We have a circuit with 60 Hertz and 10 millihenries, and we just wanna know the inductive reactance. Okay, so here's where we're gonna have two pi frequency and then inductance from here i'm just going to plug everything in so we have two times pi times 60 times 10 millihenries i know that's going to be a one hundredth or a 0 0.01 but again to solve for that since we have milla henry we're going to think milla a thousandth so we're going to think 10 times 10 to the negative third, that's going to give us our 0.01. And we just simply plug everything into a calculator, multiply everything together. And for our inductance, that's going to be our final product. We won't need to do one over everything. That's when we're working with our capacitive reactants. And when we multiply all that together, we come up with the product 3.768. And of course, we're working with reactants. So that's going to be ohms okay next question we have a phase relationship and we're looking at a purely capacitive circuit what is the relationship between the current and the voltage and that is that current leads by 90 degrees without your resistance purely capacitive okay next we're looking at the phase relationship in a purely inductive circuit and here we have current lagging by 90%. Okay, next question. We have a circuit with 60 hertz and 10 microfarads. We want to know the capacitive reactance. 
Okay, and again, our formula for that is going to be 1 over 2 pi frequency times our capacitance. When we plug everything in, we're going to get 2 times 3.14, which is always going to equal the same thing, 6.28. But like I've shown you, you don't need to isolate anything. You just multiply it all together. And then we times that by the frequency. So we have our 60 hertz. And then we times that by our capacitance. We have 10 microfarads. So again, micro, we think a millionth. So we're going to think 10 times 10 to the negative sixth. And that's going to give us 0 0.0004 four zeros one. So again, instead of being in that millionth place, we're in that hundred thousandth place. And we get 0 0.0038. We do one over 0 0.0038 and we get 263.158. And again, reactants, that's going to be ohms. Okay, so final answer, 263.158 ohms. Okay, next question. We have a circuit with a resistance of 20 ohms and a inductive reactance of 60 ohms. What is the impedance? Okay, and since we're working with inductance, we want to look at our resistance squared plus our inductive reactance squared, and then everything square rooted. So 20 squared plus 60 squared, and then everything square rooted. Okay, we simply see if we think 2 times 2 is 4 with two zeros. 6 times 6 is 36 with two zeros. We have 400 plus 3600. We square root everything. In that case, we're actually going to have to do the square root of 4000. That's going to give us 63.2456 ohms. Okay, so that's it for this video all about inductive and capacitive reactants. One last thing that I want to note is that we've been looking at everything in terms of if we have a resistor in series with a capacitor or an inductor and everything is in series with each other. These formulas I've been showing you in this video all are going to relate to series circuits. Again, we could get things that are wired in parallel, multiple resistors and multiple inductors, let's say, and we can add them together. And we get things about they're in series with each other, which of course will not always work. So it's good to know the formulas also for parallel inductors and capacitors when we're thinking about reactants and impedance and whatnot. So I'm gonna show you some pictures of some formulas. And as I show you these pictures, I'm just gonna say that it's the end of the video. If you have any questions, leave that in the comments. If you saw anything that you think may be an error or maybe you didn't agree with something, definitely make sure to leave a comment about that. Also, let me know if you liked it. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and it'll help other people know that you found it helpful and subscribe to see more. We're going to see a lot more stuff around the theory of electricity and all stuff is just to help you get paid more money. Okay, so in the next video, we're going to be looking at some voltage drop calculations. After that, we're going to be getting into sizing a lot of things, sizing conductors, sizing conductors into conduit, using different conduits, knowing the trade size for those, sizing certain wires, like our hot, our neutral, our ground, how do we size those, and a lot of things around load calculation. So we're gonna start off on simple things like dryers and ranges and stuff, but then we're gonna get into a full load calculation for a dwelling unit. We're gonna look at things like duplex units, apartments, and other things that are going to surround residential units for the moment. After that, we'll move on to some commercial stuff. We'll get everything we learned with the residential, go up to the next level, which will lead us to our commercial load calculations, doing entire commercial buildings, doing simple things starting from restaurants, coffee stands, stuff like that. Then you're going bigger, maybe a movie theater or a big warehouse facility, something like a Costco or a Walmart. Okay, and then of course from there, we're going to get into the industrial stuff. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that, but we're at least going to do an industrial load calculation. So there's a lot of stuff to stay tuned for. And if you don't know about my other channel too, I post music theory. So if you like music at all, I post music theory stuff on there. And I'm going to be posting a lot more actual music on there soon. You'll see a preview of my string quartet that I'm going to further develop. And you'll see that somewhere around the corner. Until next time, take care. Goodbye.